from Microbe TV. This is Immune, episode number 67, recorded on April 25th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast on the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Hi, welcome everybody. It's great to be here. Also joining us from Cleveland, Ohio, Steph Langle. Hey there. Yes, we're in the end of April already. Wow. Yeah, and Our from times. Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, great to see everybody. <laughs> I, I was on the train this morning and this guy recognized me. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, what did cool. he and, say, this person? Well, he, he held up his phone. He had a picture of me. He said, this is you, isn't it? <laughs> oh, <laughs> said I, wow. said I, listen, I listened to your podcast. So anyway, he lives in New Jersey and he said, one of you is in Madison, aren't you? And I said, yeah, that's mm-hmm. Brienne. Yep, yep, that's Brienne. Yep. There you go. Hello, so first Madisonian. Time, <laughs> first time I have ever been... Recognized by a non-scientist, I think. Could uh, you get used to that? Did you like it? <laughs> well, I ended up talking to him for a while to see what you know, what he's about. So yeah, I like it. I don't yeah, mind. Cool. It's never going to get excessive, you know, because it's science. But th- <laughs> the only reason I would like it is so that more people listen, right? Yeah, sure. exactly. I would okay. like a lot because that's that's how we spread our message. So. The more people listen, the more likely it is to, uh, to that someone would see you. But I think it should happen to all of us, right? But, yeah, I do uh, get I do get sometimes if I'm so you know at Case Western I'm new and so I was at there's a Cleveland Immunology Symposium I went to that and I did have a an undergrad and a tech come up and say that oh we noticed your voice. It's the yeah. voice that gets them. So that was yeah. fun. I I had someone recognize me once at Target. <laughs> oh, that's cool! Didn't the, didn't the pizza guy, the pizza delivery the, guy, the, recognize? Yeah, you? the pizza delivery guy also recognized me once, but that was because I gave a talk at Drew, um, right at the uh, beginning of the pandemic, and he wouldn't give me my pizza until I answered all his questions. Wow, that's a smart guy. Yeah, yeah. not smart Wait, guy. I'm better at answering questions, but I'm not hungry. <laughs> <laughs> well, plus cool. you have the Jeopardy yeah. fame, so there could be that. Yeah, you know? yeah. A lot of people watch Jeopardy, right? Yes, a lot of people watch Jeopardy. The problem is that there's so many different contestants that it's probably hard to remember one yeah. for very long after it, it airs, right? I think You're so. our favorite, though. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did a Jeopardy at uh, TWIV 1000, and that was a lot of fun. Yeah, that. that was neat. Cool. I really liked it. Um, don't, wasn't it fun, Brian? Oh, it I was super it, fun. I mean, I always find Jeopardy things fun, but I thought it was great. Um, yeah. I know you said your students have liked it afterwards. Um, yeah. So I'm going to somehow, fig- I, I was thinking of using it for a review session, right? Mm-hmm. That could be fun. Yeah. But um, yeah, the students liked it. I did it at the beginning of a class last week and um, they thought it was cool. They were actually answering questions. Awesome. So did you ask just questions about TWIV or was it questions about viruses no. or a combination? Oh, tell her the, the categories. Uh, the categories Brian. were parasites, RNA viruses, mm-hmm. DNA viruses, um, viral ecology, viral pathogenesis, or no, viral immunity, and TWIV trivia. Oh, so there's some. Yeah. Oh, good. So there was some. Cool. Yeah, we covered uh, everything we talk about and they were good. Brianne and I made them up. And on, the only one I, I answered was one I hadn't seen that she made up, and I got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it was so stupid. What was, this, what, what's the question, Brian? What was it? Uh, is this the, the tagline one? Yeah. Yeah, I said, this is the tagline that Vincent says at the end of every episode. Yeah, and I said, <laughs> the kind that make you sick, wrong? which is wrong. That's in the beginning. <laughs> at the end, it's another twiv is viral, oh, right? Yeah. But yep, uh, yep. Uh, yeah. I was. It was at the end, and I was so exhausted <laughs> having <laughs> your drama trying to downward. For, yeah, right. It's going down, down and uh, oh my gosh! But it was a fun celebration. Well, immune listeners who don't listen to it will have to go check that out. Yeah, you should. It's a fun episode. It's mostly really about cool. celebrating, and you know, there's not, there's no papers or there's no guests. It's just us and talking about science a bit. And the Twiv Jeopardy is really fun. So check it out. To re- for us to reach a thousand episodes for doing one a month, it would take us eighty three point three years. Yeah, I think it's <laughs> not going to happen. We'd it's have to kind of sad. It's yeah. Sad, isn't it? It's kind of sad. Well, I'm, I, we I need could super reach- supernumerary longevity. 
We do. <laughs> well, speaking of that, <laughs> let's. <laughs> how about today's paper, Brian? <laughs> yeah. So um, I am going to talk uh, a little bit about this paper that I chose. Um, it is called uh, "Functional T Cells Are Capable of Supernumerary Cell Division and Longevity." Um, first author is Sorens, um, and the last author is David Masopus. Um, and they're all from the University of Minnesota. Um, I had been hearing about some of the press that this paper was getting um, for a while and had been really excited to read it, especially having uh, spent a lot of time thinking about CD8 memory um, and some other papers from the same group when I was a graduate student. And yeah. I, w- I was very excited. I, you know, Think, was thinking about oh this is this sounds cool in terms of the persistence of memory responses and how boosting works and things like that um, and I didn't actually think about the general cell biological problem um, mm-hmm. that they were thinking about until I was really getting more into the intro of the paper and I realized um, just how cool it was and I kind of wish the title was like this paper is really cool <laughs> so that non-immunologists would know they definitely should read it. <laughs> well, I think even immunologists say supernumerary. What on exactly, earth yeah. is that? Yeah, so I, I I thought one of the cool things in the press about this was I heard someone comment, and I, I don't... I, I think this is true, that one of the authors came in as a rotation student you know, did like one of these injections or something and read out some some data and, and got on the paper. So, But the important point is that that's not such a surprise because graduate students can come in, they can do a rotation, they can generate some data. But this paper was 10 years in the making. Yeah. Yes. So they were working on this project for 10 years. <laughs> I come in for two months as a rotation student and get on the paper. That's impressive. That's the part so that's really yeah. cool. Well, and there were there have been a bunch of articles about this um, yes. in other journals, and in one from Nature Aging, um, they actually say that the T cells, the experiment is still ongoing. Um, I was going to ask. Yeah. They didn't give any insight into in the original paper, but I was curious. Okay. Yeah, I saw something that they said that this is still ongoing. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. So basically, um, usually we think about limits on cell division. Um, And that, you know, is stopping cancer, of course. Um, But we can also think about T cells as maybe being unique um, because they can undergo a fair number of divisions um, when they're activated. um, And they can then also undergo a lot of divisions on rechallenge and they live for a long time as memory cells. Um, There's a lot of sort of basic information in terms of the biology of aging in terms of how many times there's a maximum number of times cells can divide um, and, you know, telomerase that repairs telomeres um, as cells divide, maybe turning off in somatic cells. Um, you know, I know that I, you know, teach students about not about many cells not having telomerase and that giving those cells a maximum lifespan. I also teach students about um, mammalian cells usually doing a cell cycle in about 24 hours. Um, and even from the beginning, this paper was making me start to challenge some of those things and realize that T cells can be kind of unique um, mm-hmm. in how quickly they can do the cell cycle. Um, you know, they can do three cell cycles in 24 hours. Yeah, um, it's crazy, and right? Maybe how long they might be able to live. Mm-hmm. Um, so these authors um, were talking about this, and they also knew that. Um, these cells could undergo huge numbers of cell divisions, but that there did seem to be a maximum. Um, And most of those maxima were found in um, in vitro studies. And they didn't know if that was just because of in vitro culture conditions or if there really was kind of a a maximum number of divisions and a maximum lifespan for T cells, even though they're still kind of unique. So they came up with this really ingenious experimental design Mm -hmm. to attempt to detect, uh, test how long T cells could live and how many divisions they could undergo in an in vivo model. Um, And, you know, some people had tried to do similar things before, but there were always caveats. And so they came up with this really cool experimental design so that they could get around some of those caveats. Um, So in these experiments, they first took some mice 
that had a genetic marker called CD45.1. And they gave them three different infections, um, each 60 days apart. Um, and they were first with a VSV of one type, VSV New Jersey, then a recombinant virus with a VSV um, epitope, then a different type of VSV, VSV Indiana. Um, and so they, they gave the mice these three injections 60 days apart. Um, so the, the T cells got 60 days of rest between seeing the VSV. And uh, part of the reason why they used the different viruses and the different um, vaccine virus background was so that they could eliminate um, antibody um, responses as much as they could. Um, so they could really try to get this to be focused on looking at CD8 T cell responses. Hmm. Right, because the antibodies that are generated are going to maybe block, you know, they're going to bind up that antigen in future boosts. Yeah, exactly. And so it could be hard to distinguish what's going on with T cells and T cell lifespan um, when there's competition with the antibodies and that changes the amount of antigen and all of those types of things. So they, they tried to come up with a way where they could just target CD8 T cells um, and look at them in the this mouse model. And after the third injection um, with the VSV, they then um, let the, the cells rest and they took cells from the original mouse. Um, and they specifically took memory CD8 T cells that they were able to sort from that mouse um, that had this genetic marker CD45.1. They sorted 10,000 of those, uh, 10,000 uh, memory CD8 cells um, that were specific for the antigen of interest. And they transferred those cells into a mouse of a CD45.2 genetic background. So they could always mark the cells that had been transferred in um, separately from the, the cells that were from the actual mouse. Yeah, that's a nice thing about that model for those who aren't familiar is that if the genetic background is different, then you can use different reagents to find 0.1 cells in a 0.2 mouse or vice versa. It, yeah, exactly. Um, so you can always know which cells were the transferred cells versus which ones were the cells from the original mouse. And then they gave the second mouse um, three different injections with this antigen. Um, so in this case, I guess a quaternary, a quinternary, <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know what the term should be, fourth, fifth, and sixth um, exposure to the antigen, um, each again 60 days apart. Um, and they kept doing this um, for many different transfers among many different mice. Um, all and by, of by doing this, you mean they're going back they're isolating, again, the CD45.1 antigen-specific cells exactly. that have been able to persist in this new mouse. Exactly. And then take them out again out of the next one and put in the next one. So these are all derived from the original mm -hmm. mouse that was infected with the three different viruses. Yes, exactly. So um, each time they transfer um, 10 to the fifth or 10,000 cells, so they kind of get the mouse to a new baseline of how many memory cells um, they have from that very original mouse um, and do three more um, inoculations or three more exposures and then transfer again um, to the point where they actually had done um, 51 different um, exposures that those cells had seen. And we knew that they were the original cells from the original mouse because the original mouse was 45.1 and all of the recipients were 45.2. Um, and this went on for 10 years hmm. um, where they were doing their transfers. Um, and notably, the lifespan of a mouse is only like three years. Um, so these cells were able to um, it, uh, seemingly persist um, and expand and keep responding um, for three times the length of the lifespan of the original organism. And and to go back just for our audience, so they're familiar, which maybe they already yeah. are, but you had mentioned that the reason they use those three peptides or those three antigens was to target the CDAT cells. Yes. Could you speak to why that would target a CDAT cell compared to a B cell? I mean, I know we've talked about it before. Oh, sure. So um, 
the virus um, in the first exposure would target all sorts of immune responses, potentially, the uh, VSV virus. Um, but then the second exposure was an exposure with vaccinia virus. So it was a different virus that had just um, the uh, portion that CD8 T cells respond to in mm -hmm. this MHC type, K of B, um, added into that vaccinia virus. So the mm -hmm. only sort of memory response would be a memory response to that NP um, bound by K of B, which is only seen by CD8 positive T cells. Right. So, right, using the MHC complex. Yes. Then tetramers, then you can look for that. And so it's another genetic way to, to very selectively um, target CD8 T cells. Yeah. Um, cool. So I just think it's super cool. Um, and so they, they do show at the beginning um, how both the transferred cells and the endogenous cells are responding. Um, and they do see some differences between the transferred cells and the endogenous cells. So that was the recipient's own T cells um, are still responding to the first, second, and third time. Um, and the transferred cells are responding to, I don't know, the 31st, 32nd, and 33rd time or whatever it is in that particular mouse. So we can watch all three, all of the responses of both sets of cells. They do mm -hmm. seem to be a little bit different, but they do mm. respond each time. Right. Um, they noted a little bit about the differences, and that was something I had kind of wondered about. But um, Well, one cool. would expect that anytime you put those memory cells into a new mouse, the the old cells, or the CD45.1s, should respond to that primary injection better than the endogenous ones from the recipient mouse because right. that hasn't seen the antigen before, right? And then the second the second exposure that they get, they respond pretty similarly. So it's kind yeah. of like a little better with the, uh, the, they call them iteratively stimulated. So the ones that came from the original mouse are a little better the first time in most cases, but not every case. Yeah. And then they're better, uh, they're about equivalent the second time. Yeah, I, I didn't think it was as obvious Th those data weren't as obvious uh, as I would have expected, maybe. Yeah, no, it isn't as ex obvious as we would expect. But perhaps that the, those those memory cells needed to get woken up for some reason. Yeah, maybe perhaps. <laughs> mm. <laughs> they get tired after a while. <laughs> right, right. Well, and and that's sort of a key thing because they were waiting sixty days between yes. injections here, and they wondered, do you have to wait sixty days between injections? Yes. Um, right. Do the cells need to rest? And so they repeated this experiment first, waiting 30 days between injections, and they basically saw the same thing. So 30 days was enough rest, not 60 days. Um, and then they tried again where they only rested the cells for seven days, and the cells were not able to um, survive iterative stimulation. So that rest of at least 30 days was very important for allowing those cells to have their uh, super longevity. Uh, that we saw. You know, it's it's funny because for the remember the paper we did last week, uh, the uh, summary of immune responses mm -hmm. to COVID vaccines. They were saying that um, three to four weeks of, was too mm -hmm. close between the booths yep. because it sure, interrupts right. affinity maturation. But that's something yep. different, I guess, right? Yeah, I think that well, that's a B cell thing, and that's also yeah. not mouse. Um, but I think the really we're not we're not mice. <laughs> I know it's shocking. <laughs> oh, I forgot that little point. Yes, you're right. But but at the same time, I think the overall idea of the spacing matters and yeah. rest yeah. for these T cells to differentiate or rest for whatever lymphocyte to differentiate really matters. And you know maybe we haven't taken that into account as much as we should have. So the species and then it's T and B cells, which are all different, right? Okay. But it would Good. suggest that for both T cells and B cells. Boosting close together is not good. Right. right. Yeah. Right. And Rest is important. Out <laughs> that mechanism and what transcription factors matter. Mm. I'm sure there are people doing that right now. So yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I think yeah. it's a oh, yeah. great Hot question. Mm -hmm. um, so at this point, they knew that the cells could persist. They could get these responses. And they sort of wondered whether some of these cells, you know, what was going on with the telomeres? Because mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. should see uh, telomeres, you know, be shortening. We don't usually think about telomerase being on in somatic cells, um, mostly just in earlier cells in development. So they looked at the telomere length 
in the mouse genome, the reference sequence. And then they looked at the telomere length in T cells and they saw that telomeres were dramatically longer in T cells in the first place, in naive cells. And they remained really long in all of these cells. So Uh there's already one thing I need to change in some of my uh, lectures. (laughs) So, and this is a question that's going to be, you know, we can talk about at the end. So then it's, it's the environment that's shortening the telomeres mm. in these other experiments that have observed well, telomere shortening? Or is it the cell type? So is yeah. it T cells are unique? Yeah, and, yeah I think right. that's it. And other cells, you know, have yeah. never looked at the other people have never looked at T cells or have not looked at T cells. Yeah, I mean, in other cell types, there's no telomerase. The enzyme is inactive, right? right. Yeah. So it must yeah. be active in T cells and it must be uh, specific. And it would be interesting to know if there are any other cell types. Maybe B cells, it's also hmm. active. I think it would be good to look at it. Or maybe someone has. I just don't know. Yeah. I think it would be good to look at. And my guess is a lot of those things maybe people will hopefully look at after this yeah. uh, type of paper. Yeah. Um, so usually when telomerase is active, um, we think of those as maybe being some tumor cells. That's where we usually see mm. some telomerase uh, activity. Yeah. Um, and the idea is that those cells maybe have lost growth control. Um, so right. they wanted right. to see, have any of these CD8 T cells lost growth control, um, right. given that they have telomerase active. Uh, Which so, was uh, yeah. suspicion of some of the earlier studies that they did in vitro and they didn't know if they became immortalized or had some other cancer phenotype. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in a few places, they kind of hint here and in some of the other articles that I read, um, the little news articles, that they kind of suspected that that was something that they were going to potentially see. Yeah, because if if any one of those cells at any point over those 10 years became transformed, then you're not looking at normal T cells any longer. Yeah, and and that cell would have a selective advantage um, and would be dividing a lot. So they took some of these cells and did a transfer into another mouse um, and did not infect with virus. They just looked at how much the cells divided um, at sort of a background homeostatic rate. And they also looked at some cells that had only seen antigen once. And they saw that these cells were not um, proliferating homeostatically at a background rate. Um, in fact, they proliferated a little, little bit less than the activate, the one-time activated cells. So it didn't seem like these cells were hyper-proliferative. And if you just put them into a mouse and let them let the mouse hang out, um, the cells didn't seem to dramatically increase in number like they had some sort of selective advantage and were transformed. Hmm. Right. Hmm. Um, so it seems like, you know, these this is really these cells having this ability to divide uh, frequently. Um, then but, they, but they required yeah. the stimulation. But they required the stimulation, absolutely. So they were responding to stimulation over long periods of time, not one, transformed. One thing I don't think they did was do any like other antigen nonspecific. So to see whether these cells just have a capacity to proliferate when there's inflammation hmm. or if it's always antigen specific. Yeah, that's Do you a, remember seeing any, I don't, I, this is the I second don't. time I've gone through this paper. We did it in a journal club and I don't remember seeing anything like that. No, I don't remember seeing anything like that either. One um, would assume that these mice are being exposed to things, mm-hmm. although they're probably an SPF specific pathogen free, but I mean, there is continuous exposure to commensals and things that right. yeah. one would think if that were going to happen, it would happen. Yeah, I mean, they they have this figure where they're looking at uh, those cells over 173 days um, in mice that are just hanging out, potentially um, responding to those commensals and other things. And they don't see it there, but it would be cool to see another infection model. Right, right. And the, and it is important, the piece of data that you just mentioned, they kind of say stable. Yes. Right? They, they don't really have a measurable decline. Right. They, they stay relatively stable and they... Um, Don't go up a lot. Don't go down a lot. (laughs) Right. Um, So they also had this idea that maybe, um, you know, there was something, maybe somehow they were getting like contamination of cells that had not been transferred. They kept talking about contamination of young cells. (laughs) 
<laughs> um, from the um, original mice. And so they did some RNA sequence work to look at the cells as they've gone through different numbers of stimulation. So they have, you know, naive one stimulation, three, six, nine, 18, 27, 30, 39, 45. If I had 45 stimulations, I'd be tired. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they see that these cells really do kind of look unique when they've been iteratively stimulated, um, both by RNA sequencing and by flow cytometry. Um, and so they find that these cells are unique cells. They're not some kind of weird young cells that are contaminated, contaminating because they have different markers than mm. um, the young cells do. And they look specifically at markers that are often talked about as exhaustion markers, hmm. yep. um, like PD-1 or TIM-3. Um, and they see that these cells have an increase in their expression of exhaustion markers. And sometimes people see those markers and say, oh, T-cells are exhausted. No T-cell response. We're done. It's over. Mm -hmm. PD-1, so the T-cell responses are definitely over. Yeah, you um, see that a lot in the literature. You do. You yeah, know? you do. And just not further investigating that functionally. And, and of course, the relevance is a lot of therapies have been developed to target PD-1, anti-PD-1 mm -hmm. therapy. So Yeah, and people forget that this is a marker that's upregulated very highly, very early upon antigen stimulation of T cells. Mm. So it's actually an activation marker. Right. And an exhaustion marker. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, um, you know, they, they saw, oh, well, there's this increase in, in quotes, exhaustion markers. Um, but, you know, that's as far as, as sort of they go on that and that figure. And then they want to look, well, okay, so then are they, those cells exhausted? Can the T cells actually function at this point, or are they exhausted? And if you would have asked most people, oh. <laughs> if you had if you had taken these cells out mm -hmm. of a mouse ten years ago, yep, and you've been passing them iteratively through a mouse, they express exhaustion markers, and you put them into a new mouse or take them out, you you would think, yeah, they're probably going to be pretty crappy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I would have totally thought that. You wouldn't have even had to tell me about the exhaustion markers. You would have just had <laughs> right. to tell I me. I would have been like, there's no way they're those cells. Maybe they can homeostatically proliferate and maintain themselves in the mouse, but these are not going to be functional. Yeah, these cells. Th these cells aren't actually really going to do anything. I never, ever would have expected that these cells would be doing anything at this point. Um, so they look at... Um, these cells, and they do find, you know, some, the PD-1 is accessible, but um, in terms of chromatin, but it's sort of different than what you see in exhausted cells. Hmm. Um, they look at gene expression, and the gene expression has some overlap with exhaustion genes, but it's its own unique um, profile. And then when they actually look to see, can these cells divide in culture? They totally divide in culture. Mm -hmm. um, and can these cells make cytokines by intracellular cytokine staining? Um, the answer is yes. They can mm -hmm. make interferon and they can make uh, TNF-alpha. Um, yep. It looked like they made a little less. I would have loved to see exhausted cells there um, on the mm. same scale just yeah. for comparison's sake. But right. my recollection is that exhausted cells make so little of these cytokines, especially interferon gamma, that... I don't think this decreases hmm. too much to write home about. So it's sort of like, oh my gosh, these are not exhausted cells. You know, they compared them with LCMV, with cells from LCMV infection that we know are exhausted and they look different. Um, some overlap, right. but generally a different phenotype. Um, right. And that yeah. is just like shocking to me. Yep. It's you don't not mind something that they, I would have thought of. Mm -hmm. You don't mind that they didn't look at CTL activities, right? Well, so they didn't look at CTL activity in vitro, mm. um, but the final thing that they did was actually they transferred the cells yeah. Yeah, okay. into a naive mouse um, and then infected the mouse with listeria expressing that same antigen. And they saw that the mice could tr uh, clear listeria or could combat listeria better. So the cells had better function um, in controlling infection after transfer. Than naive animals. Then compared to naives. Uh, naive. But they didn't they didn't compare it to like a a mock recipient animal that had been pre-exposed. True. And had memory. Right. True. 
So uh, yeah, they yeah. only they only do the tertiary transfer or. 33 airy <laughs> transfer. <laughs> so, you know, they don't look at some of the, the traditional, like after a primary um, exposure to, to see how different they are. But yeah, certainly nice. these memory cells seem to control. And I think that that's probably better than doing a CTL assay in vitro mm-hmm. yeah. um, because the CTL assay in vitro requires some additional culture of the cells and that could mm-hmm. complicate matters. Hmm. Right. Yeah, I really, um, when you think about the proliferative capacity of CD8 T cells, and they, they, they say some fun stats. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. Like, that's like, that, that <laughs> caught everybody's attention, right? I know. So it's actually expanded data figure three. They uh-huh. have all of those stats. Oh, okay, they, cool. that they did themselves. They, so, yeah. So, in fact, they show the radius of a mouse lymphocyte compared to the radius of the Earth. And if you looked at all of the progeny from one mouse lymphocyte after uh, these divisions, you would get 30,000 times the volume of the earth. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, and, yeah, I put in the show notes because uh, so David Massapost, and is that the last name? Massapost, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Massapost, at University of Minnesota. And I put a um, his graphic because he, so he has a YouTube talk. It's, there's a, series called Global Immunotoxin. Anybody can oh, go and yeah, 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 watch yeah, yeah. those. And, and this is from last year. It's from a year ago. And so the data was before they would have submitted because they submitted June. I think it was June of last year. Uh, July 22. July. And so the stat that he has up here is that so one naive CD8 T cell can produce enough memory CD8 T cell progeny to feel like superior, <laughs> which is relevant because he's in Minnesota. <laughs> so I think that's why he used that body of water. But yeah. it's it really is fascinating. It makes you think about the biological rules for longevity and life. And they talk a lot about the differences in the beginning. There's a couple of sentences uh, between species. And it was thought that the rate of mutations can be linked to the, the, the lifespan of an animal. But CD8 T cells seem to break some rules. And of course, in the species, we don't really have the reagents to do this experiment. Um, yeah, I, I was thinking about that. I was like, in some ways this would be cool, but I'm pretty sure you could not hmm. find CD45.1 versus CD45.2 tortoises, <laughs> um, nor would you have any of the other tortoise reagents. <laughs> right, no, right. Definitely but not. I'm sure people are thinking about, I mean, in, in cancer, adoptive transfer of CD8 T cells is a hot area. And I think, of course, the problem with tumors is you need an antigen. This is what the beauty of the study yes. is. It's a very defined antigen that you can track. Tumors are challenging. All the an- all the antigens can differ between per- between people. But effectively, if you had a, a solid tumor that you had an antigen that you could target, you could save somebody's... Well, I was thinking, you know, what would be the equivalent study in humans? Hmm. Yeah, the... Could, Go ahead, Brian. The, I think the hard part mm-hmm. there is the chronic versus acute aspect of the antigen. You're because right. You're right. In in all of the previous studies where people have really thought about this, they've been thinking about this with chronic antigen stimulation. Right. right. Mm-hmm. And so here they show in that first figure the importance of the rest. Yep. Um, yes. Um for exactly. these cells to maintain their ability to um, have longevity. And so you know, part of the question is, you know, how situations where you have repeated exposures that are acute like this, um, but then also how would you mo- make that modeled in, say, a, a tumor treatment yeah. where mm-hmm. where the it's chronic? Right. Mm-hmm. Which seems to be the driver of the exhaustion phenotype is the chronic right. nature. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's like, oh, could you... You know, as a young person, bank your CD8 T cells and then mm. stimulate, you know, use them in a future disease state when you're older because you could imagine that they would stay alive. But that's a different situation because they're being frozen, not continuously passaged. Yeah, I'm just uh, thinking of what would be the equivalent in humans that could be tested. But doesn't this imply that T cells that are established when you're young should last your whole life? Right. Memory. Yeah. Memory cells. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. they do proliferate at a very low level. So they turn over. It's not the original one cell. 
yeah, that's of course, still of course. there, but it, yeah. it definitely is maintained. Yeah, and and so the only issue is if you're older and you encounter a new pathogen, which seems to have happened in the last few years, <laughs> maybe. then maybe you don't uh, establish T-cell memory as well, and that's a problem, right? Well, this is an interesting thing because uh, a lot of us have chronic viral infections. Yeah. And there's this idea of inflationary memory. So as you're continuously exposed to the antigen, mm -hmm. more and more and more of your T cells in a proportion of overall available T cells mm -hmm. become specific for that and you lose some other specificity. So your breadth, I don't know if I'm uh, explaining this very yeah, clearly, yeah, sure. the breadth of um, repertoire of T cells that recognize different things diminishes over time. So you have okay. fewer fewer available T cells to recognize new things. Yeah, all well, these so, herpes viruses mm -hmm. that we have, for example, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. right? CMV yeah. is a major one that contributes to, yeah. you know, by yeah. the time you're our age, or at least a couple of us, it's like 50% or of your T cells can be CMV specific, yeah, model, yeah. if I have that number right. Yeah, uh, Felicia Goodrum mentioned that on right. TWIV. It's mm -hmm. an outrageous percentage of- It's crazy. Yeah. What yeah. an evolutionary advantage too for CMV. You know, it's weird. Yeah, it's well, it keeps weird. it in check. I mean, it's less likely to transmit. Maybe I, I don't know, but it, it seems to be kept in check. But I guess that, it's true. I was more thinking just that well, it, it had the it has the capacity to replicate that long enough to dominate the response. It's funny because true, fair point. I mean, I mean check and it's keeping it in check isn't really. Important. What's important is that it transmits, and every time yeah. it reactivates, you know, it gets in yeah. saliva mm -hmm. and yeah. urine and, and so forth, it and, it, and it yeah. transmits. Yeah. So I don't know yeah. what yeah. the yeah. 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 it may well, be a, a host but, issue, right? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. But this uh, the idea is well, isn't it also true that as you age, you don't effectively make memory uh, T cells as you did when you were younger? I think you that said, is true, right? The capacity of the thymus. To, to well, so yeah, so but that's how many naive cells are coming right. out of the thymus. Yeah. So you are producing mm -hmm. more naive cells as you age. Right. Um, no, less, fewer. Yeah, fewer. I'm sorry. So if you are exposed to a new virus that you've never seen, can you establish T cell memory as well as you could when you were younger? That's my question. I think the idea is no, but I'm not sure that I can point to specific data about that. In humans. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 I, yeah, I'm not sure either. Hmm. We should have data on that, though, for SARS-CoV-2. Somebody must have looked at, depending on your age— do you have a better ability right. to generate those memory T cells? But I well, don't know if well, I've and seen I've, it. I feel like I've seen overall um, data on vaccine responsiveness with age, mm -hmm. and there mm -hmm. certainly is reduced vaccine responsiveness, yes. but I don't know if I've looked specifically at, say, the memory T cell um, capacity mm -hmm. or something. Yeah, if you're a memory yeah. T-cell person and you know this answer, you can write in. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's not about do you have any T-cells that could become memory because we know that diminishes over time. But mm -hmm. the question is, if you have them, do they have a different potential right. mm -hmm. to become right. memory cells? I feel like yes, but I, again, I can't cite, yeah, cite no. the data on that. Yeah, I don't know. The other, the other thing that I find remarkable is they say, you know, with all these divisions, there's no, I mean, there's, they don't the cells don't get transformed. Which I'm, is well, right. it's a paradigm for transformation, which exactly. eventually leads to oncogenesis. Is that an unchecked division? Every cell division, you accumulate mutations, and eventually you get enough to to affect growth control. Right, right, and then the cells divide and become tumors. So why doesn't this happen with these cells? Do they have a better error correcting machinery? I doubt it. Right. Well, you know, <laughs> I wonder if there are people out there that might uh, criticize how in depth they did analysis of yeah. whether or not they have restriction of growth or not. Cause really all they did was put them into a mouse yeah. and leave yeah. them. And, and the number that are there is always a balance of cells dying and cells proliferating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if you haven't left them there that long, maybe I, I, I and I am hand waving at this point, but maybe they could be partly transformed, but, it's not enough to, you know, make the mouse all T cells by the what? time they go to transfer them into another could, animal. Could you imagine maybe if they had transformed the, if they had transferred them? I'm, I'm thinking of this off off the cuff. Um, yeah, yeah. If they put if they transferred into say a nude mouse or a skin mm -hmm. mouse, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, whether that would be a slightly better measure. 
It might. I, I, there's probably some assays that people do to measure that a little bit more robustly than just a transfer for. But they know. did. They did remind me, Brian. Pull them out and compare CD, the the point one versus the point two, and the transferred proliferated slightly less. So there seemed to be a check. They they weren't at the same rate or outgrowing. They were almost a little less, maybe because these markers are. And and that's comparing it to day 14 primary stimulation, which is probably the most robust proliferative. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And actually, so I, think, I guess it's hard to. Yeah, to that was actually one reason why I found that plot from Figure One, um, where they looked at the endogenous versus the transferred cells with all three um, exposures to be kind of interesting. I went and went back and looked at that to see how those cells were responding, say, after third exposure compared to the endogenous cells. Um, and it, they were a little bit less, um, as Steph mentioned, but um, it, I didn't feel like it was uh, mm-hmm. the same across the board. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I, think- I guess one other argument against it is you didn't mention the data, but they did look at whether they could identify these uh, transferred cells in other tissues besides just oh, right. floating around yeah. in the blood. And they do find them. Yeah. In in the female reproductive tract, in the salivary gland, in the small intestine, in the lamina propria, also the intraepithelial lymphocytes. So they're they're populating the body, and I guess one would argue that if they were forming a tumor, that they might do that in a in a site mm. there, right? Maybe so, sure. And then they don't seem to be. So that might be an argument against that, right? Yeah, but I think Vincent's question about why do T cells not have those uh, mutations? Though is a really interesting question, and if we could, if one could do those additional experiments and sort of really uh, show uh, that, then trying to figure out what is it that's unique about T cells that protects them from that transformation is a fascinating question yeah, because you totally. could imagine it, it could figure out what that is, yeah. and could be useful, could right? Allow other cells to do that same thing. Yeah. That would be amazing. Yeah, it's. I, I didn't know this at all. This is really uh, eye-opening. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see it in other species too, though, right? As you said before, right? Yeah. yeah. Nice. Well, and I'd it's love tough, to see tough it with other do. cell types. Yes. 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 Right. Hmm. I, I, there's definitely, there's a big, uh, for obvious reasons, but there's a, there's a big effort in many labs looking at how do you expand the human lifespan, yep. mm-hmm. uh, longevity. There's a lot of people who have a lot of money in, like on the West Coast who are very interested in this and invest in <laughs> yes. biotech companies and institutes who study this. Uh, sometimes you can see their papers and you can see their little... Um, I wouldn't mind living 200 years. <laughs> I could live longer, but like eventually it's like, okay, it's enough. You no, know, no if, you're, if, you're, if, your life is, if your life is good, <laughs> obviously... Yeah. Yeah. But you don't you don't want to be debilitated. But you know, vampires don't want to live that long because they have to get a blood every night. They have to get a blood <laughs> meeting. That was a trade off. It's a trade off. <laughs> they get tired of doing that. You, you uh, need to have some antigen stimulation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, I had a um, Cindy may, may remember and Brianna. Last year we had a fundraiser here at the. Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 So one of the potential <laughs> donors said to me, "If you can." If you can make me live 10 years longer, I'll give you a million dollars. Wow. I think there are a lot of people with a lot of money who, who I would wish, be willing. Yeah. Well, I no, mean, sadly, we cannot. It, oh, a, a, it, a, brand, a brand new institute out on the West Coast was started by Bezos, all about longevity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, hundreds of millions of dollars to do that. I don't understand the fascination with living more. I mean, isn't 85, 90, 95 enough? <laughs> But you're never enough, right? If you're enjoying yourself, it's never enough. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's never enough. Yeah. Well, it sounds like your T cells can, what does that make? 270? 90 <laughs> times three? <laughs> <laughs> um, Indeed. But I, yeah. I think it's also kind of interesting just in terms of thinking about, say, immunotherapy or something like that, of how could yes. we make mm-hmm. more cells for some of these therapies to use right. as, as donor cells? Mm-hmm. Yeah. For sure. But yeah, definitely, you know, it was a, it's a fun paper because it did get a lot of popular press. It's unique 
in the longevity of the experiment, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. mirroring its name. Um, Yeah. And I do recommend if people want to learn more about this lab, that, that global immunotox is good. I think people would like it. Oh yeah. In the show notes. Yeah, it is. It's great. Yeah. So and he's, he's very entertaining. He's a great speaker. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, it, it just, to me, first caught my eye because it's so similar to things I did in graduate school. And then as I got mm-hmm. more and more into the paper, I was like, oh, this is just cool. Yeah. yeah. It's not just, you, this is my lectures. topic. It's just cool. Yeah. Cool. You can update. I know you mentioned a couple different things that are going to maybe change in your lectures. Absolutely. I have to now actually talk about T cells and telomerase. And I have to talk about what, how quickly can a mammalian cell divide, <laughs> um, at, Cindy, what was the reaction all of in your journal things. club? Similar? You know, what were some things that they were talking yeah, about? Yeah, I mean, people tried to pick it apart, but they, okay. I, I think the big thing was, it was like, so what do we actually do with this information? I mean, it is <laughs> so really cool, and it is so neat that you can do this, but yeah. what practically are we applying it to, right? So if you come and think about how would they get a grant to study this? You know, what what is the fun- fundamental thing that we are discovering that's going to move the needle on how we understand the immune system or immunotherapy? It's it's a little harder to think about that. Well, and I think it does it does highlight probably why this was a pet project that went on for ten years because there probably Correct. was no dedicated funding to this. Yeah. There probably was not. No, but you it, can't. But it, you can't. Yeah. It's very hard. And it's also, you know, goes back to the conversations we have about the basic biology of T cells that maybe don't in the immediate have this mm, translational exactly. capacity. But what we learn, PD1, for example, you know, can right. be later on um, translate. Yeah. I, I was thinking about the same thing that there probably, you know, was not a specific grant funding this. Um, I noticed the second to the last author. Um, was, I think, sort of a graduate student around when I was a graduate student doing some of those <laughs> papers that I was looking at. Um, I think she has her own lab there now. Um, so I'm wondering if she's kind of been working through all of this over that time. Um, and so, yeah, I, I can't imagine there was a grant on this at the beginning, but I sort of wonder now, you know, could you write about, well, we want to figure out why T cells are different um, yes. for yeah. longevity purposes, um, certainly, but it still would be hard to do it in a time frame of um, some other kind of grant. A PhD uh, (laughs) thesis. Well, that's the thing. Like, how do you convince a PhD student to work on this? I trust that you will work on this and you will be an author on this paper in eight years. Yeah, sure. (laughs) Yeah, Which makes sense why, you know, you have rotation students help do this work. And then once you get to the end, it's the postdoc or whatever. It has has to be a side product. Yeah, yeah, and I think it, it, um, it... Blasted it open when the the technologies became available to really sequence more in depth the cells to yeah. be able to characterize those yeah. differences. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. But you, you can imagine that since, say, in 2013, 2014, really what was going on was just every 60 days um, yep. injecting the mice and then doing your adoptive transfer, sorting, counting, um, re-injecting. Mm-hmm. And, and 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 I would think you'd have to have replicates of this because if sure. one mouse dies or you get a contamination during your purification or something gets messed up, it, it has so much colony. potential. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh <laughs> go my terribly gosh. wrong. Yeah. And the yeah. one thing I was thinking of is you better be sure where you start your faculty position is where you want to be for a while because there's no <laughs> way you can move with an experiment like this because if you move those mice to another institution, you just mm-hmm. don't know what's going to happen to your experiment, mm-hmm. right? Sure. Sure. You know, they made so well two things. I will say that the second to last author, Veva Vessis, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing yeah. that, but they have a collab situation going on because if you go to their website, it's the Welcome to NASA Puston uh, mm. Sevi's Lab. So that's just something to bring up that's cool. I've seen a lot of this where, you know, you can get more things done and apply for grants together as kind of a collab. So I think that's a neat model. And then the other thing, um, I just blanked on, so go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, um, Cindy mentioned that how many replicates you have to have. And I actually hadn't, like, I hadn't totally thought of it in the same way. So I was just flipping through the methods and figure legends and things. And that is not mentioned anywhere. So I would love to know just how many they started with um, to make this work. Right. Right. So that brings me to my point. They made us euthanize all of our mice 
when COVID shut down. And this is not COVID work and they apparently are still going. So maybe they made some exception based on, you know, he petitioned. Oh, we, we had lots of petitions Did here you? Okay. to maintain like very rare strains and things like that. Yeah. If they were, yeah. if you could not purchase it again, you were allowed to maintain, okay. uh, you know, breeding colonies and things. And I, I would assume that somebody would make a huge stink about this experiment. Mm -hmm. Be yeah, like, there is so no too. way. <laughs> I'll give you 60 days while they're sitting there resting, but there's no way that we're just going to let these guys go. Right. Yeah. So in retrospect... Yeah, at first I thought uh, maybe it was because, you know, when COVID hit, that's when they decided to end this experiment and publish the paper. Yeah. But the fact that they said they continue them, it's still going, means that that wasn't necessarily the case. Uh, this reminds me of the... Um, the, the long-term experiment by Richard Lenski at uh, Michigan State, right? Yep. He's been passing E. coli for since 1988, I think. That tens of thousands yeah, of generations. Yeah. And seeing how it just evolves over the years. I think he has 12 different cultures going all the time. And of course, wow. they, they're growing rapidly. So he's always subculturing them on and on and on. And in cool. looking at phenotypes and genotypes, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I guess they don't do the genotypes here. They could sequence... Um, yeah. and look for some point mutations or something, I guess, too. Well, that would be interesting to do to quantify the mutation rate, right? Right. Because in, in an in a accurate way, not kind of anecdotally. I think that would be interesting, yeah, and have a control of some other cell type. One and would they, think if they were that forward-thinking that they probably banked some cells at each stage so, so that hope you could so. go back to them and either isolate RNA or isolate DNA or whatever you need I, to do. I think they must have because they do, you know, RNA-seq with, say, the primaries yep. or the tertiaries. Exactly. Those were yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in 2012. Um, right. And I don't think you could have done the RNA-seq then. So you you must have they must have been forward-thinking enough to bank cells. Mm. So they, I guess they could do whole genome sequencing and find out if there are mutations. Sure, of course. There, there were some observations in that in his YouTube talk that I didn't want to bring up because it's not published, but it is out there, um, you, you know, publicly. What's interesting that they observed is that in the iterations, there was an increase in alpha-4, beta-7 expression and an increased propensity of these cells to go to the gut. Hmm. So, so hmm. the more replicates they did, the more cells were trafficking to the gut. Alpha-4, beta-7 is a, hmm. a gut-specific integrin. And so that's interesting if you think about, let's look at our guts of older or younger individuals, and do you have a greater hmm. accumulation of CD8 T cells in older versus younger? That would be cool to see. Yep. Would you guys like to do some email? Yeah, we got some time. Sure. I just looked it up. It's been like, I don't know, a year Too since long. we did. Oh, boy. <laughs> Email. I know I have. There's somebody here, Vincent. He's emailed you a couple of times. We have not responded to his email yet, and then he emails me that we haven't responded. <laughs> well, is he on this list here? Or he no? probably is. Neil Greenspan. Oh, I know. Yes, Neil Greenspan. Yeah, yes. they might be long though, so I don't know if you know if, if we're ready for them. Uh, I have one here that I have all crossed out. I don't know why. Because <laughs> we wrote. Oh, I know. This is the ones for Pandy and Mixter. Remember the immune education episode. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. So I think Where, we did talk about that. He said, no, but he said he clicks on something and it doesn't go anywhere. Oh, so I'll we're, hook him up with them. I'll connect them. Connect them, yeah, because yeah. that's okay. one here we have at the bottom. Gotcha. But there, many of these are, are suggestions for episodes. But anyway, let's try. <laughs> like, and, I love Neil, but he's, he's the type of um, professor who, in the middle of a grad student talk, will ask you to define an epitope. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's very philosophical, I would say. He definitely brings like the philosophy to to. Us. We get but, he but, he writes us on um, on Twitter. Twiv. Right? In fact, we had made some statements about convalescent plasma a while ago. Sure. And he wrote us, and he copied Casa de Val. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> and so we ended up getting Arturo back to clarify things, which oh, was fine because yeah. he he uh, it was eye opening. It was good. Interesting. But yeah. uh, Neil Neil writes the Twiv quite a bit. Yes, and I can see that he's a. Uh, academic type for sure. That's fine. I have no problem with that. Um, all right. So let's start to do, do what we can here. Uh, Cindy, can you take that first one? I get the short one. Yeah. yeah. So Brian, <laughs> Brian writes, please discuss or elaborate on the immune autoimmune disease known as hypogammaglobulinemia. I'm interested in the origin and the research and possible current state of a cure. Thank you, Brian. Wow. 
We could dedicate so, an episode to that. Yeah, we could, but right straight off, I mean, hypogammaglobulinemia is, is basically, as I understand it, um, typically an inability to class switch to IgG as efficiently. Mm. And you end up with less uh, IgG, or you can just have less antibodies altogether. Mm -hmm. okay. And um, if you have that, I, 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 the best and easiest way to, to fix it is to give gamma globulin. Yep. So you collect the serum, almost like your convalescent serum that you were just talking about. Mm. Um, you take serum from individuals who you know, presumably have been exposed to many, many different things that you might come in contact with. And then you just take that as an injection to provide the antibodies that your body is not able to provide for itself. Yeah, I am not sure about uh, this in terms of autoimmune. Yeah, uh, it's an immun a primary immunodeficiency yeah, typically. I but I know more about it as an immunodeficiency. Um, oftentimes there are deficiencies in either CD40 or CD40 ligand or AID. Mm -hmm. So um, the B cells and T cells can't talk to each other and you can't get class switching. Right. Um, and for a lot of these patients, um, bone marrow transplantation mm. of um, precursor uh, B cells or T cells that don't have that same genetic um, mutation um, tends to reconstitute the population mm. and uh, be really helpful. So I think for a lot of these patients, bone marrow transplantation mm. is uh, something if they don't do um, immunoglobulin uh, therapy, like Cindy mentioned. So I wonder um, the difference between a gamma globulinemia mm -hmm. and yeah. hypoglobulinemia. So I know a gamma globulinemia right. yeah, is what you were just describing as primary immunodeficiency. Right. So I don't know about yeah, a specifically so autoimmune I, hypo. I don't know. Do you guys have any insight? I I do not. Um, I a gamma globulinemia. Globulinemia. <laughs> it's hard it's to hard. say, right? It's hard to say. <laughs> Forgive me. Um, but you know, coming from having a veterinary virology background, that's definitely the way that we describe newborn animals who um, are not, did not suckle on their mothers because they do not have any passive transfer through those placentas of those species. They're too thick. They don't have the FCRN transfer. And so they're born without any antibodies. And that's how we would clinically describe them until they can get colostrum and then they would have, have it. So that's not what they're talking about here, but just an interesting fact. There, I have a review article here on hypogamma globulinemia. It says... Common variable immunodeficiency is mm -hmm. often the cause of hypo gamma globulinemia in adults, and X linked A gamma globulinemia is the most common in the pediatric population. Hmm. But both of those would be primary immunodeficiencies, right? Because yep. it's a it's a deficiency of an immune component exactly. that leads to a phenotype, not necessarily autoimmune Auto disease. And you know, we're we're yeah. saying this without really defining it. So primary immunodeficiency means that there's typically some genetic defect yeah. or mutation that causes a defect in a component of the immune system. Whereas an autoimmune mm -hmm. disease is typically something where uh, a tolerance of your own body has been broken and you start to react against self. However, the, there are secondary causes of these, right? Like Correct. steroids or nutrition, infections, chemotherapy, malignancy, etc. Yep. So, yep. And they say, that, I'm sorry, they say that they have to, if you're a doctor, you have to distinguish between them to treat them Primary problem. and secondary. Right. Sorry, yeah. Brian. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, do you think might there be an autoimmune type of hypogammaglobulinemia where maybe B cells are getting attacked so you don't make antibodies? That could be. Yeah. yeah. Why not? Yeah. Let me see if, there, if they say anything about that. No, there's no autoimmune stuff here. Hmm. Oh, wait. No, it predisposes kids to autoimmunity having this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Wow. One sentence, you can talk forever, right? Uh, Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Jane writes, hi to the immune team. I have just discovered your podcast and it is a great way of immersing myself in preparation for the start of my immunology PhD, which begins next month. Yay. Could you possibly discuss this paper, <laughs> which has just came out? It's called a, human, a physical wiring diagram for the human immune system. 
um, as by Jared Schultz at all. I would really like to know, like to know what you think of it. Um, <laughs> Check and, out Immune because I talked about it yeah, uh, that, we a did couple that. episodes ago. Yeah. <laughs> it was and, one of your great rapid suggestion. things. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah we'll, we'll put a link for that episode. It was one of those ones where we did a bunch of papers, right? Yep. Okay, Steph. I think okay, we sure. called it a tangled web of wires. That's right. Oh, right. All right. Erica writes, hello, Vincent, Cynthia, Steph, and Brian. Dr. Lisa Salen, Salen is a viral immunologist and professor at UMass Chan Medical School. I have no idea if she would come talk with you about the emerging immunology of MECFS, but I think it would be worth to try asking her if she'd be willing to come, or David Seistrom, Ron Davis, Akiko Iwasaki, or listen to Bateman. She disclosed in the article I'm providing that she suffers from the disease, as you already know, is widely misunderstood and generally not taken seriously in the medical community. And unfortunately, because of a terrible lack of funding, it is hard for researchers to study. Even so, emerging research is demonstrating a good deal of abnormalities in multiple body systems. Also, post-exertional malaise, as opposed to fatigue, which is also present, is required for the diagnosis now. Hopefully, this will help researchers find the correct population of ME sufferers since so many conditions involve fatigue and reprodu reproducible biomarkers will emerge. Honestly, it may be worth me sending a separate email to Vincent and Daniel about providing some time in one of Daniel's clinical updates about the most important, in my mind, ways doctors can help victims of ME and potentially also a subset of victims of long COVID who will likely go on to meet the criteria for ME. That most important thing is the phenomenon of post-exertional malaise. Managing it correctly and giving the correct advice about how to do so is likely to help people and very unlikely to harm them. New ICD codes will also be coming out soon, so hopefully that will allow for better tracking of patients if the codes are appropriately used. I developed this disease suddenly October of 2011 after a case of shingles and then a subsequent undocumented viral infection three weeks later, and I am primarily bedbound. This is a familiar story and a sad one. I wish that this disease yeah. received funding. It deserves. Thank you. Oh, and I hope... The next many years, research will point us towards better treatment. Thank you for all you do. I enjoy listening to your shows and learn a lot. And then provided the two articles, sincerely, Erica. So firstly, we just, of course, want to say we're really sorry that you're yeah. experiencing that because you're right. It is very serious and it doesn't receive appropriate funding. And mm -hmm. I, can, I can think of a couple reasons why, and then everyone else can chime in. Things that don't have very clear ideologies are very challenging to pinpoint in terms of a yes. community to study them. Things mm -hmm. that don't have defined ideologies don't allow us to develop models and reagents and cell lines. Um, really, you're left with patient populations, which I think COVID has helped push us more in the direction of developing these cohorts. So other comments, but I, I see those as big challenges. Yeah, Cornell has a center for MECFS study and so we have several investigators who are looking at this kind of thing, and they are collecting patient samples pre and post exercise because this post exertional malaise is a really important component of that. And so they're doing a lot of single cell RNA sequencing analysis. I know this because I was on a thesis defense yesterday oh. Oh. that was working on uh, yeah. you know various different immunological phenotypes associated with the disease. And then again today we had one of the other people who was a, a faculty member on the 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 thesis committee gave a work in progress talk today where they were talking about single cell data analysis. So there is, uh, you know, for Erica, there are a lot of people thinking about this and working on it um, and trying to find biomarkers, trying to find immuno um, signatures or deficiencies, um, which could potentially be targeted for therapy. But you're right, the, the etiology uh, Steph is a problem. Yeah. So there is a there are two camps and they don't agree. They are polar opposites. Some think that there is a viral origin or a chronic viral infection that we haven't identified yet. And the other group thinks it's completely unrelated to viral infection. So I I hope that the the COVID long COVID thing has brought to light that a viral instigator is uh, 
is more likely than some originally were thinking related to this. But it's also important, um, they've been emphasizing this over the past two days when I've been listening to them talking, that the long COVID really is fundament- is different it's oh, different yeah. than MECFS. Um, it, you know, it has a lot of similarities, but there are enough differences that they're not considered the same disease. Um, it, it definitely has a true viral origin. And the other thing that was emphasized is that, uh, you know, you can it, vaccination against SARS-CoV-2 seems to help in some instances. And so there is some therapy towards that in the long COVID, whereas for MECFS, because we don't know any viral trigger and we can't figure out a chronic viral infection, we really don't have any therapies or cures or anything for this disease at this point. I just want to say I'm sorry to hear this about uh, Dr. Lisa Silen. Um, I uh, know of her work. Um, it was another set of uh, papers that I spent a lot of time with uh, as a graduate student um, and that I enjoyed very much. So um, I'm very sad to hear this about her. Yeah. So I have two things. First, uh, on my virology blog, uh, David Tuller writes about mm-hmm. MECFS mm-hmm. almost every day. We've now given him his own part of the blog oh, wow. to, to separate it away from the virus <laughs> virology. So he's very prolific. You should check that out. And then the other thing is uh, this a paper just out of uh, Ian Lipkin's lab mm-hmm. about uh, a study, a multiomic study of uh, MECFS patients, 106 cases, 91 controls that have uh, they showed deficient butyrate producing capacity in the gut microbiome is associated with MECFS, wow. right? Mm. So there's some gut dysbiosis that's involved there, and that'd be interesting because that's something you might be able to. Correct, Change, maybe. Yeah, so right, yeah. I will put a link to that. We're going to try and get uh, the author of the the senior author of that on TWIM, I think. Oh, that's cool. To talk about that. Uh, we have a, a letter from Jared, who also links us to the uh, wiring diagram. Oh, it's a cool paper. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Highly recommend it. <laughs> very cool immune map project. As a multiple sclerosis patient and an avid TWIV listener, this seemed interesting. I'm a programmer who inspected MS as a computer defense project. I created a list of each event and mechanism relating in the chain of events situation. My illness tried to find a method of disrupting them. It was a blast. <laughs> this project and your episodes about EBV were illuminating. Hopefully this has been a fun background. Your shows are always great. Jared is in Seattle. Maybe we could do another round. Uh, back to Cindy. Me. Okay. Tamar writes, hi, immune hosts. I've been catching up with old microbe TV episodes from the last month or two, and I'm currently watching Immune 57, Bacteria, the New Cure for Wounds. That was a fun one. Um, When listening to your discussion about using Neosporin versus Vaseline and how it affects wound healing, I wanted to evangelize on a topic I recently discovered, moist wound healing. We, medicine science, have known about this superior method of moist wound healing since the 1960s, but somehow we, the public, are still being told, keep wounds dry and let them air out, which is literally the opposite of what we're supposed to do for better and faster healing. I think you did mention that, uh, Vincent, when we were doing that episode. Um, uh, goes on to quote, a moist environment has been proven to facilitate the healing process of the wound by preventing dehydration and enhancing angiogenesis and collagen synthesis together with increased breakdown of dead tissue and fibrin. This improves the aesthetics of the wound while decreasing pain. And, th- and there's a, a link to a paper there. Um, Tamara also Tamara also says, additionally, use of Vaseline or Aquaphor, a petroleum-based skin protectant, has been shown to have equivalent efficacy to using an antibiotic ointment. So there's a, two additional links there. Um, this isn't topically related to immune, but I thought you would be interested in knowing more about it since it was discussed, but nobody had specific expertise or knowledge. <laughs> You know, it, it's that way. I hope this information helps you and your viewers with future wound healing. And thanks for the great podcast. Even as a non-scientist, I learn a lot. Best tomorrow. And and probably for the people who work in sepsis, you know, the MDs in the clinic, if they if they're listening, uh, you know, I think it's going to depend if it if it is a wound that you just got and it's not deep and it's not infected, mm. may, maybe just moist. But for people who have 
bed wounds or who have chronic infections or who have antibiotic resistant infections, that might not be the same advice. So like having known people who've gotten bed wounds, I mean, moist is not good. So yeah, sure. It yep. might yep. depend. Yes. But I have seen the uh, data on Vaseline versus Neosporin um, in a few different places. Uh, so it's great to see some more links on that. <laughs> yeah. It'd be interesting to do a price comparison of Aquaphor <laughs> or Vaseline versus Neosporin. Yeah. <laughs> mm. <laughs> or I guess open air would be free. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Brianne. Sarah writes, hello, I heard you wondering about post-splenectomy infection issues. In medical school, it is drilled into our heads that patients must patients who have had a splenectomy or functional asplenia from sickle cell disease, for example, mm-hmm. must be vaccinated against encapsulated bacterial organisms. So that's pneumococcal, meningococcal, and haemophilus influenzae. Of course, I don't can't recall the details about why, but perhaps <laughs> you can make sense of that. Uh, and Sarah is an MD. Mm. Hmm. I mean, probably has to do with B cells. I'm imagining. Um, you know, antibodies against bacterial infections, maybe? That's my thought. Yeah, I, I guess my my thought on it is that the spleen is typically important for blood infections, whereas draining lymph nodes are important for tissue infections. And so maybe it has something to do with where these bacteria hang out is mm-hmm. one possibility. That's interesting, yeah. Another possibility is encapsulated bacteria uh, tend to be more resistant to antibodies and require complement more. Okay. I, I can't off the top of my head think of a connection as to why that would require the spleen more. Yeah, right. But maybe it's something about complement-coated microorganisms are best cleared by the spleen. Spleen and so being vaccinated against those provides better protection than mm. the normal post defense when you're uh, just trying to generate an, an immune response. But I may have talked myself into a corner and none of that <laughs> makes sense. So I don't know. Hypothesizing, no, no, on, based on not much information. It's more than I know I people have. can survive without spleens, obviously. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Um, yeah. All right. I don't one, know. One more, uh, Steph. Okay. Hi, Amazing Immune Team. In episode 57, you talked about an autoimmune paper. I have two suggestions for you, but because I'm not an immunologist, I really don't know if these are good suggestions or not. They're both open access papers. One a few weeks ago, the Lupus Research Alliance recognized Akiko Iwasaki's work on lupus. This might be a good choice for you guys as both immunology and virology, uh, in parentheses, endogenous retroviruses. And then the second one, this paper appears to make a very big claim. The claim is that a single protein, neurotin, is implicated in the development of bad immune responses. Would love to hear how real immunologists, scientists think about this paper and the strengths and weaknesses of the research and evidence. And there was a commentary a few months later. I haven't opened this yet, but we can take a look. Uh, Thanks so much for all the work you do. It's truly amazing way to learn a new and complicated field. Thanks, Jeff. We should. I mean, I, I imagine she's quite busy. It would be fun to have a Kiko on the show. It would she's be. been brought up yeah. a couple of times. Yeah, yeah. I, I know. I'm sure her schedule is treacherous, but <laughs> maybe someday. Um, and then the paper, the first, the second paper, the very big claim. Uh, I, this hasn't really crossed my path. This was in 2021. I think we were dealing with the pandemic and <laughs> probably just escaped me, but it's called follicular regulatory T cells produce neurotin to regulate B cells. Mm. So one of the people we had on the show back in 2000, gosh, a while ago, 19, uh, Alexander Dent, he talked about Mm -hmm. regulatory T cells, follicular regulatory T cells is a co-author. But yeah, we could, this could be a paper we do. Sure. Cool. Or get somebody to, from the team to talk about it. Yeah, right? that probably yeah. be a good thing. Yeah. Someone said, uh, "Let's see why." Uh, I can't remember. We, we had a, a first author on some podcast recently uh-huh. instead of the PI, but they said you should get more of the first authors. We it's should really, Absolutely. really yeah, fun because they're easier right? to get a hold of, of course. Right? I mean, yeah, yeah. And they were the ones doing the experiment, so yeah, right. yeah. 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 Okay, I'll look into that for this paper. Although uh, they're in that, Australia. Yeah. Have you ever 
podcasted with somebody in Australia? Yeah, so, well, it's not straightforward. Basically, uh, 7 p.m. here is 7 a.m. there. That's about oh. as close, you know, they have to be willing to get up early. Yeah. And 7 p.m. is kind of late for us, but that's the only thing that works. Huh. Otherwise, you have to, if it's 6 p.m., it's 6 a.m., that's too early, and 8 yeah. p.m. is kind of late for here, but that's how, yeah, that's how you do it. Or we can all go. <laughs> I like that plan. I like that. <laughs> I vote for that one. <laughs> all right. Go to Australia. <laughs> all right. That is episode number 67. You can send your questions, comments to immune at microbe.tv. If you uh, like our work, we would love to. Uh, have your financial support. That's how we do all this with your support. We don't use ads uh, and we want you to feel like you're um, promoting something good. So you can go to microbe.tv slash contribute, find out various ways that you can contribute. Cindy Leifer is at Cornell University. Cindy Leifer on Twitter. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. Steph Langle is at Case Western Reserve University. Stephanie Langle on Twitter. Thank you, Steph. Yeah, thank you. And for those, I don't know if we'll see each other until then, but those going to AAI, the annual yeah, meeting of the there. American Association of Immunologists, um, Brianne, Cindy, and I will all be there. All No, okay. Cindy and I will be there for one day together. So <laughs> if, you, if you see us, uh, say hi. Say hello, yeah. Go up to them and just yeah, say hello. Say they, they would love it. They would love it. We don't bite. <laughs> Brianne Barker is at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Music on Immune is by Steve Neal. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. We'll be back next month. Mm-hmm.